The one, of course, that I'd highlight because it's definitely central to a lot of my work is there is a cognitive element at play as well. So in terms of how people reason and how people think. So one factor that comes up quite a lot in the literature is a reflective reasoning. And what I mean by that is the essentially, I'm, I'm oversimplifying slightly, but it's kind of the ability to not run away with the first thing that comes to mind, but to like stop and reflect on what you're thinking about and kind of think it out basically. And what we find in a lot of studies is that people who believe in conspiracy theories are not very good at this. They tend to be quite bad on cognitive tests that measure reflective thinking. Hi, Michael. Hi, Paul. Thanks for joining me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Right, so I'll get straight into it. My first question is, why do we love conspiracy theories so much? Ooh. <laughs> so right out of the gate. Or why are we drawn to them? That's, that's, that's a very good, it's a very good question. I mean, it's a question that I'm, I'm building my entire career around answering, I guess. Uh, my research is very much oriented towards that. And I mean, in many ways, we're still trying to figure it out. But we've got some, I guess, preliminary ideas. So, you know, one idea that I'm quite attracted to is this idea of uncertainty reduction. So human beings in a very fundamental sense, whether or not we believe conspiracy theories aside, human beings are very much motivated to resist uncertainty. We like predictability, we like order in our environment, and anything that disrupts that, we're quite uh, strongly motivated to, you know, respond to it and kind of restore order. And, you know, some people manage that better than others. You know, some people are okay with a little uncertainty, other people absolutely detest even the smallest uncertainties and conspiracy theories are one of many ways that we could respond to such uncertainty and particularly in contexts that are inherently quite uncertain so if you think about the kind of things that you know the kind of events as it were that produce conspiracy theories things like the covid pandemic or the 9-11 terrorist attacks or something like that you know, these are naturally quite frightening events, right? They're quite scary, even for, you know, whatever your beliefs, it's quite frightening and very much un uncertain. So conspiracy theories may be one way that people re react to that uncertainty. It's a way of dealing with that uncertainty, at least in the very short term, a way of saying, okay, but here's how I explain this. It's all because of you know, the Illuminati doing this or government doing that or whatever. So it's quite comforting then in that sense that it allows us to remove some of the chaos or um, unpredictability from life and it enables us to see the world more clearly, even if in reality it actually isn't. I think that the, the key word in there is chaos. Absolutely. It's uh, it's definitely a response to that. I mean, the world is kind of inherently chaotic to a degree. And, you know, we all have different ways of coping with that. But it can provide comfort, conspiracy beliefs. Certainly there is a sense of, you know, I've, I've, I've got your number. I know what's going on now. You're not fooling me. Whether or not it helps us see clearly in the long term is a slightly different question. Because... It might make me feel better about the immediate short term uncertainty, you know, my kind of emotional uncertainty, if you like, my kind of emotional state, my affective state. But then what does that mean for my future when I still have to go out and interact with this very chaotic world? Now, if you've got a belief that plays nice with the state of the world, if you've got a belief that actually captures, you know, statistical regularities in the world if you'll forgive the slightly technical term uh the uh like a uh, think basic patterns real patterns that are in the world that you know we, we want our beliefs to reflect those patterns so that we're not caught out so that we're not uncertain so that we can anticipate that's where conspiracy theories kind of come unstuck as a strategy because they might be very good at explaining the thing that immediately unsettles me but when it comes to interacting with the world later 
they're not going to predict what's actually there and then i'm just going to be more uncertain if that, if that, that makes sense yeah that's quite an interesting point so what impact does it have psychologically when someone discovers that the conspiracy that they held so close to their belief system turns out to be a fallacy is it does that have more of a an impact on someone's psychology or how do people how do people cope with that generally not very well mm. so i mean in general there are a lot of negative consequences associated with even having the conspiracy belief in the there are links in the psychology literature with things like depression, things like high propensity to stress responses, par high paranoia, things like that. You know, definitely paints a general picture of conspiracy believers not being very happy. And then, you know, when you then encounter something that threatens your strategy of dealing with that uncertainty, of course, it's going to unsettle you even more. It's perhaps going to make you more prone to uncertainty than you were before, more stressed than you would have been otherwise. Because, of course, you've got beliefs that are not helping you to navigate the world you're in. They're not predicting things that are happening to you or happening around you in your immediate environment. So, yeah, I guess, I guess having, having your beliefs challenged like that would be quite unsettling. Mm. But it would happen quite often because their beliefs are not predicting the world very well mm. and is there something more attractive to a conspiracy theory when it's seen to be believed by large numbers of people or even a group that you identify with does that make the theory itself more attractive it might do it might do so cer certainly the kind of in-group element that you touched on there is quite big because one thing that we see people who believe conspiracy theory it's doing quite a lot, you know, just build, building on this idea of their beliefs, not playing nice with the world. What's what, what is one way you can get around that? Well, you can sort of change what parts of the world you're experiencing, right? You can, you can be someone that watches mainstream news, which is going to constantly tell you, no, you're wrong, which is of course going to be unsettling, or you could drift more towards, uh, I mean, the term echo chamber, is becoming quite popular these days. You know, you can kind of insulate yourself. You can find like-minded people on Facebook or on Twitter and things like that. And can, they will continually reinforce your beliefs. You'll continually reinforce theirs. And you get kind of, you know, kind of closed shop. And you get all the benefits. And then in addition to that, of course, you get all of the kind of regular benefits of being in a group, which we all enjoy to a degree, depending on what groups we're in. You know, we like... Uh, you know, feeling like we're part of something. We like uh, having kind of positive social identity as well. And I guess this is one version of that that is obviously quite specific to conspiracy beliefs. They could, mm. you know, get something out of that, particularly if they are... So one, one thing that is often associated with conspiracy belief is being quite socially isolated as well. Mm. So it might that might be something that someone who believes these things lacks that they then get via their belief so it might make it could make such beliefs more appealing and yeah, there's definitely something to that yeah it's interesting that point about you know isolated people might see it as a uh, a way of connecting with other people possibly or it might make them feel like they're part of a, a group that they lack in their life are there any other yeah. um characteristics or traits or um, things that make people more susceptible to being um, attracted to something like that. Yeah, so the one, of course, that I'd highlight because it's definitely central to a lot of my work is there is a cognitive element at play as well. So in terms of how people reason and how people think. So one factor that comes up quite a lot in the literature is a reflective reasoning. And what I mean by that is the essentially I'm, I'm oversimplifying slightly but it's kind of the ability to not run away with the first thing that comes to mind but to like stop and reflect on what you're thinking about and kind of think it out basically and 
what we find in a lot of studies is that people who believe in conspiracy theories are not very good at this. They tend to be quite bad on cognitive tests that measure reflective thinking. And we find that these are the sort of variables that are perhaps more directly related to the, the mechanisms behind how conspiracy theories are acquired. There are other kind of more distal factors as well. There are things like uh, there's associations with education, for, for example, pretty much as you'd expect. People with higher education levels have lower levels of conspiracy belief. We also find in some contexts that socioeconomic status can interact with that as well. But that seems to depend, like it seems to operate via variables like reflexive reasoning. If that makes sense. Mm. Yeah, it does. Um, and is it would it be fair to say that somebody who um, hasn't had uh, academic training or is less educated would be more likely to not question assumptions or question assertions that don't have evidence? That's a very good question. And I think it's tempting to think that, I think. Yeah, there is some, there is something quite uh, parsimonious about that idea, right? This idea that, you know, so someone hasn't been to school or they haven't been to university or something like that. They haven't got the, the critical thinking skills needed to evaluate misinformation and things like that. I think the actual picture is slightly more complex in the, so we talked about uncertainty, for instance, and how exposure to uncertainty can make conspiracy beliefs quite appealing. I'd argue that people who are, as it were, you know, maybe they come from a lower educational background or a lower socioeconomic background or so on. It might be that because of the challenges in their life that they face, because of inequality or things like that, that perhaps they are exposed to uncertainty more often. Right. And then for that reason, conspiracy beliefs perhaps have, perhaps some of the benefits, albeit the short-term psychological benefits to these beliefs, perhaps such benefits are more salient to such individuals. Mm. Whereas someone who's quite comfortable and perhaps doesn't necessarily need that comfort. I mean, it's, it's definitely not unique to lower socioeconomic status, but that might be one reason why individuals from uh, kind of lower educational backgrounds, you know, there, might, there are there are kind of other factors in play that complicate the relationship a little bit. It might well, it, it's, it does still seem to be there, but it's, mm. yeah, it's, got, it's quite complicated, I think. Yeah, that makes me think then that um, the propensity to believe conspiracy theories isn't really a modern phenomenon. It's something that would would have always been there and it's not necessarily a symptom of our modern world. Is that fair to say? I completely agree, yeah. Uh, so you have plenty of if relatively early examples. You have, of course, the Great Fire of Rome, which the citizens of uh, ancient Rome blamed on Emperor Nero and then he then blamed on the Christian community in Rome as well. You have, uh, let's see, the Great Fire of Rome, uh, Great Fire of London. Sorry, I just yeah, a lot of fires. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, Great <laughs> Fire of London in six. Definitely, uh, uh, there's a prodigy joke in there somewhere, but I'll leave that for someone <laughs> much funnier than me. Um, yes, Great Fire of London in 1666 was blamed on pretty much every like everyone. There was a conspiracy theory for for the French, for the Dutch, for the monarchy, yeah. for whoever you like. At the same time, how, however, the individual proliferation power of conspiracy theories absolutely probably is quite modern in the yeah. sense that the Great Fire of Rome conspiracy theories wouldn't have been believed in ancient Greece or in ancient you know, Celtic Britain, for example, they would have been believed in Rome by Roman citizens. Mm. Whereas in this day and age, of course, our, our ability to communicate with each other has, you know, exponentially, I mean, just by this, this call is proof of that, right? We're yeah. able to talk to each other from other sides of the UK. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, we, we could have done this even if one of us was in Japan or something like that. We have yeah. Twitter, we have Facebook, we have social media. So if, you know, maybe the next general election comes around and I'm feeling a bit unhappy about one of the, one of the uh, candidates and I want to post a conspiracy theory, anyone in the world will see that within mm. five seconds, you know. Mm. So it's... But but as a psychological phenomenon, absolutely, it's not at all modern. No. So that means, I suppose, that it, it's easier now for a, a conspiracy theory just to, to take off and be accessible to so many people. But I suppose that suggests that ones that did um, gain momentum previously before things like the internet probably were more credible because they needed more behind them to kind of stand up that's an interesting thought so in terms in terms of proliferation like when they mm. didn't have the ability to go anywhere mm. what was it that made them proliferate yeah. i mean on the one hand perhaps 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 i mean i mean the one that's more plausible probably would be more able to proliferate than one that isn't but i suspect there might be some other factors at play as well. So, uh, for example, so b before I got into the psychology of conspiracy belief as my topic of research, I was interested in religious cognition as well. Right. And there is a fact, there is a kind of a phenomenon there known as the kind of minimal counterintuitive representation. And what that basically means is that the most memorable religious concepts, the ones that spread most easily, the ones that people find most attractive. And again, I'm kind of oversimplifying a little bit, but essentially it's concepts that are just a little weird, just a little bit away from what we already know. So if you think of like unicorns, unicorns, it's a horse with a horn, but in all other aspects other than the horn, it's a horse. It's a horse, yeah. If that makes sense. Mm. Yeah, or Pegasus, horse with wings, but nothing more. Whereas if I said that it was a horse with 18 legs and four wings and 12 eyes and two heads and whatever, there's a point where it stops being a horse and it just sounds like it's something a, incredibly a weird. And that yeah. doesn't... Exa exactly. So it, it seems it certainly seems to be that way, with, with certainly with religious concepts that you get you know, the ones that spread the most, the ones that are just a little bit different. There's some interesting studies around that in like memory literature mm. as well. And I suspect it's probably the same with conspiracy beliefs as well, in that the ones that do best are the ones that are, you know, for the most part, still kind of similar to like a non, like a more official account. Mm. but just slightly different. And it, and one thing that kind of alludes to this is there are some qualitative studies where, you know, where people go out and they in, kind of like this, I guess, but slightly different, uh, where you go out and you interview people who believe these kind of things. And in some studies, people who believe in things like 9-11 being a false flag or climate change being a hoax, stuff like this, they're more than happy to... So, so they don't like being called conspiracy theorists. For a start, they find the label quite distasteful. Right. But also, they will happily point at people like David Icke, people like Alex Jones, the kind of infamous, you know, conspiracy theorists hmm. who believe things like flat, like a reptilian shape shifting reptilians running the earth. I believe is the one that that's one David Icke is quite fond of. Alex Jones has talked about like mind controlling worms or something oh, okay. like that. And they're quite keen, they're quite keen to point at these. Yeah, uh, they're quite keen to point at these people and go, we're not like those guys. We're not like those conspiracy theorists. That's kind of weird. So it's, what that tells us is there's something, there's something more attractive to the average person, at least relatively, uh, relatively about 9-11 being an inside job than it is about the world being run by shape-shifting lizards, right? I suppose one's physically possible and one... There's no evidence whatsoever. Yeah. Whereas one, you could imagine, you know, it's it it's it could play out like a movie. Um, yeah, you know. yeah, exactly. Mm. Yeah, I think exactly. there's something in that about the ones that seem to, and the ones that interest me the most are the ones where 
there's a grain of truth where there's there's almost one aspect that could be actually quite very believable, but then that makes does that you know the rest of the theory then kind of almost has a yeah. bit more credibility, almost like a halo effect, whereby it's like well if that bit's true, yeah. maybe the rest of it's true as well. Um, so there's 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 two there's two things I can say about that. So number one is that there there are certainly examples where that it, that's the case, and it does kind of muddy the waters a little bit. So I'll give you I'll give you two. Number one, let, let's take nine eleven as an example. Now, you know the evidence is very much against the conspiracy theories here. It's it it was not perpetrated by the Bush administration or the FBI or anything like that. There were not bombs planted inside the towers, etc. However, one thing that certainly doesn't help matters is that. So I don't I don't know if you've ever seen uh, this documentary on it's either iPlayer or Netflix called The Looming Tower. It's kind of like a, doc, a dr dramatized documentary series no, that looks no. at uh, if it, lo it looks at how the FBI and the CIA were run in the kind of build up to nine eleven. It's a really interesting watch, uh, and it kind of summarizes what I'm about to talk about quite nicely. So if anyone's interested, feel free to check that out. But the, the short version is basically that there was a lot of office politics going on between the FBI and the CIA. They basically didn't get on very well. And one of the two, I want to say it was the FBI, it could, it could have been the other way around, but I'm about 80% sure it was the FBI. They had some interesting intelligence that, if followed up on, perhaps could have revealed that there was an attack being planned or something like this. And the CIA's response to this, in a nutshell, was basically, you're stepping on our toes, you're trying to do our job for us, we don't like this, please leave us alone. And, I mean, that's not a conspiracy theory, that's just incompetence. But, <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? Mm. But at the same time, I mean, it raises, it raises legitimate questions about the way that these services are run. That's not the same thing as a conspiracy theory, but if, there, if there's enough legitimate questions there, is it any wonder that other people start asking other questions on top of that, even if the answers they come to are kind of crazy, a little bit, for want of a better word? Yeah, no, that, that, that makes sense. I mean, I think um, it, it, it could also be that it's a, almost an exaggerated version of the truth as well. You know, it's not that there could yeah. be, you know, it, it, it's very difficult to know the truth until there's concrete evidence for it, whereby it's beyond doubt. And sure. very rarely in life do we get that certainty about many things, you know, so you, it, it's very difficult to, to jump to conclusions. Um, Sure. But one thing I, I was going to ask you is, do you think also that there's not some entertainment value in conspiracy theory? So a lot of the the consumers of it, rather than being people who are kind of, you know, got tinfoil hats on and believe in it, are actually just consuming it for the sensationalism of it, almost like they, like they consume a, a film. That's a very good point. And... Yeah, I, I, I think that there is something to be said for this idea that even even people that don't necessarily believe them are nonetheless kind of interested in them because they are they are kind of provocative is probably not the right word. I guess they they stimulate in, something. Intriguing. Right? I mean, how many? Yeah, I guess. Yeah. yeah, I guess. I guess. Oh, so, yeah, they're intri They are quite intriguing. I mean, I mean, even I must find them intriguing somehow. Otherwise, how would I have got to the this topic of, of study right but um yeah i get i guess you know how, how many times do we see a movie and you know there's a conspiracy underlying the plot or something like that you know it, it's definitely a, there is definitely something to be said for it and i think it arguably adds to this uh you know we could we could be forgiven given its entertainment value for thinking that you know, there's no harm in it, that it's just, it's just a laugh. And I don't know whether that's entirely true, but I can see how people get there. But a lot of conspiracy theories seem to be directed towards like a powerful figure or the, or an authority figure or something like that. It's, it's kind of like mm -hmm. a, 
there's always a, a power dynamic. Is that always the case or are there examples where it's the other way around? So it, it does get interesting because there are a few examples where the perpetrator, I guess, from a more objective point of view, we might say they don't seem very powerful. But in the eyes of the person that believes the conspiracy theory, there is a kind of perception of power. So, for instance, we could separate conspiracy theories that are popular amongst, for example, far right audiences from kind of other conspiracy theories. We can think about things like, like during the Brexit referendum and the last two US presidential elections, there were a lot of conspiracy theories about uh, about migrants, for example, right? There was, you know, ranging from stuff like they're cons- like uh, non-European migrants are conspiring to uh, uh, Islamize Western society and introduce Sharia law and stuff like this. Or in the case of US presidential elections, there were things like, you know, illegal voting and, oh, the uh, migrants from Hida and everywhere are trying to, like, get illegal votes in and the Democrats are covering this up to get elected and stuff like this. Now, in terms of power, it's kind of difficult to imagine what what kind of social power such individuals would have, right? Because they're, they're coming from very dangerous places into a, a country that's not theirs, and maybe they don't speak the language, maybe they don't know how like institutions work and things like this, and they're struggling and so on. It's very difficult to imagine what possible conspiracy theory they could perpetrate, if that makes sense. Mm, it does but, make sense. But in the eyes of someone who's quite racist or quite xenophobic or quite jingoistic or nationalistic or whatever term we want to use, from their perspective, perhaps because they themselves, like many people who believe conspiracy theories, they feel quite powerless or they feel quite helpless or uncertain or whatever, you know, they're they're seeing these groups as having power that they don't necessarily have or might not necessarily have. So you, you, there are some interesting power dynamics at play. I certainly think that the perception of power would be necessary for conspiracy theory, but it's it's not necessarily any kind of objective authority or objective social power. I see. Yeah. Do you think it's power in numbers, maybe? Do you think people see large groups and think even though they're not they haven't got any official power, there's enough of them to conspire? Perhaps. The honest answer is I don't know, mm. but maybe there could be something to that. I mean, I mean, the other side of this is that you do have conspiracy theories where you kind of get the opposite in that the perpetrator in the alleged conspiracy theory is kind of amorphous. So you get, you know, like the system or kind of shady gargantuan groups like the Illuminati or the Freemasons or, you know, it, sometimes even in very vague terms so anti-semitic conspiracy theories yeah they're talking about a group that does exist jewish people exist but at the same time the group that they're alleging this kind of grand jewish order it's kind of amorphous it's you know they're not necessarily talking about anything specific or tangible in Mm. terms of like there's a group kind of thing so it goes both ways. It, it could go both ways. I don't know. I mean, there might be a kind of deindividuation aspect to it. So if you're the kind of xenophobic racist who thinks that all Muslims are the same or something like that, on the one hand, there might be a lot of Muslims and you might see a big group and think that's a big group that overwhelms. But on the other hand, you're kind of collapsing them into one, right? And kind of one big perpetrator and saying, that this perpetrator is conspiring against my society, that this person is, that this uh, perpetrator is doing this, as it were. Mm. So, it's, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Mm. I, I'm not, I have to think about that one a bit more. Where do conspiracy theories originate from? And I'm talking really about the ones that don't have a basis in truth. Where do they actually come? Is it one individual that just thinks one day, oh, I'm, I'm going to make something up and spread it or is it a collective or is it um is does it happen organically how how does it happen i mean it probably depends on the conspiracy theory but for example let's take the moon landing conspiracy theories as one example right so the 
alleged motive that people who believe this tend to claim is that the US did it so that they could claim victory in the great space race. So, you know, it's it, it might be that this had its origins in Soviet Russia. Perhaps there are people in Soviet Russia who didn't like that they lost the space race. So they had to put it out there that, you know, kind of like a football fan after they've lost the game saying they cheated. This isn't legit. It's fake or whatever. Then you think about things like, you know, I mean, uh, the kind of uh, illegal voting example that we just talked about. I mean, you see people like Trump tweeting that kind of thing, and then suddenly it takes off, right? I mean, in in that sense, it it kind of looks like it's starting from one individual in a sense, but you know, whether whether that's a kind of organised political strategy on his part, because that's the kind of that's the area of the electorate he wants to mobilise, of course, when he's campaigning. Or whether it's just the rantings of a person with some very questionable psychology. Uh, I don't. I don't think he's at all healthy in that regard. Uh, it's hard. It's hard to say. I mean, yeah, it's. It, it probably depends on the conspiracy theory. I appreciate that's not the straightest answer, mm. but. Yeah, it sounds to me like it's it, it originates from a place of influence to some extent. I don't think mm. there's one person in their bedroom that could make a a theory just go around the world. I think it has to have some kind of strength behind it in the film. either either the truth <laughs> or yeah. or a strength in terms of there's enough interests for this to take off. I don't know what you yeah. think. Yeah, I mean I mean it's a good point. I mean in, in theory you and I could sit here right now and come up with a conspiracy theory about something. It's possible. It can be done. There must be people in their bedrooms who, when they are upset about something they see on the news, probably say to themselves, Oh, this is all a conspiracy, so that they can do this XYZ and mm. you know, people probably get quite creative. I would struggle with the idea, I think I'd agree with you, I'd struggle with the idea that most conspiracy theories in circulation started like that. I think mate, there must be one or two and someone has probably without you know there might be one individual somewhere that came up with like just pulling one out of, out of thin air but like the 77 ones for example the conspiracy theories about 77 bombings maybe that started from just one individual and it spread everywhere but mm -hmm. i don't i don't i don't think that's how most of them are are getting around even though it's, I mean, as, as as we've already discussed as well, the kind of individual proliferation power of these individual conspiracy theories, you know, it makes that kind of thing theoretically possible. And it's, certainly, you know, it gives people with a platform the ability to spread, you know, misinformation, conspiracy theories and so on. But yeah, it, it pro you probably need a few ingredients there before you get enough momentum and it kind of comes mm. in the discourse, as it were. Mm. Do you think there are instances where, or rather, what 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 do you think the motivation is for somebody spreading one that's not true? So, broadly speaking, probably some form of self interest. Right. So, for example, let's take climate change as an example. So, if we tomorrow collectively decide as a society that we're done with oil we're done with gas we're going to go full on for solar full on for hydroelectric full on for wind there are industries that would immediately lose out in that uh, you know there are, there are companies that would lose their profitability overnight and you know we could you could certainly see a situation where those companies you know the kind of bps and shells of the world would have a vested interest in keeping the truth about climate change you know climate science as it is suppressed or making it questionable or these kind of ad hominem attacks on climate scientists and things like that and even at, at state level as well i mean russia as a you know natural gas giant the middle east countries like saudi arabia and you know very much uh you know big big when it comes to oil these are you know parties that definitely would have an interest in mm. you know keeping their industries alive at the expense of the planet and mm. again 
going back to the illegal voting example, I mean, you have a very immediate beneficiary of that one in that if enough people believed that particular conspiracy theory, then that would undermine Joe Biden's administration, it would undermine the Democrats, it would undermine uh, at a societal level, it would undermine minority groups who are you know, overwhelmingly more likely in the US to vote Democrat as opposed to Republican. And the immediate beneficiary of that, of course, would be the Republican Party, Donald Trump, and so on. So, yeah, there are definitely certainly beneficiaries of, mm. of plenty of conspiracy theories. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, and I suppose, I mean, in some sense, there are times where, as I mentioned, there's sometimes turns out to be truth behind them, you know, then yeah. the cover-ups are perfectly plausible and, and have been shown to have happened, you know, numerous times in, in history, whether it's Watergate or um, Hillsborough, you know, there, there are instances where, yes. where authority has been shown to be deceptive and, and um, cover up the truth. So I suppose how, how, you know, how can we, how do we ever get to a point where it goes from conspiracy theory to conspiracy fact? It's a very good question, and it's one that I I don't know I have a strong enough answer to that, because, of course, in the philosophy literature, in study of conspiracy belief, there are a lot of debates around, you know, this kind of thing, even right down to defining a conspiracy theory. You have perspectives that treat conspiracy theories as inherently false by virtue of being conspiracy theories and then when they when you get enough evidence around it it's no longer a conspiracy theory anymore you then have other perspectives that use the label fairly consistently they don't bring in these kind of epistemic caveats around truth and evidence they just say are there conspirators are they doing a thing and do they have a motive it's a conspiracy theory and then let's just evaluate each one individually and there are a lot of debates around that and it it kind of muddies the waters a bit on how best to navigate them because you know you're right some conspiracy theories are absolutely true watergate happened you know there were cover-ups around hillsborough the moscow show trials uh volkswagen emission scandal as well where you know they lied about their emissions and then tried to cover it up uh absolutely so i guess the question yeah the question is how do we tell apart one from the other right and i guess what you don't do is you don't say it, it's a conspiracy, therefore it's wrong. Like there are people conspiring, they're doing a thing and there's a motive, therefore it's wrong. That That's not the problem with the idea that 9-11 was a false flag. That's not the problem with the idea that climate change is a hoax and that scientists are you know, financially motivated in peddling it or anything like that. The issue is more with you know, a, a level of base probability, right? So let's let's take the moon landing as an example. When the Apollo moon landings happened, there were over 400,000 people working for NASA. Really, how likely is it that a fake moon landing is getting kept secret given that many people? You don't even need all of them to be in on the secret. How likely is it given that 10,000 of them know about it? I mean, that that gets out. Right. Eventually that, that comes to light. And what separates things like Watergate, things like, you know, uh, cover ups around Hillsborough, things like the Moscow show trials is that we don't have to go looking at shadows in photographs and things like that to substantiate those kind of claims at all. We, we, we have evidence that's right there. And I guess. What I'd round what I'd round off on that one is that as a as someone who studies the psychology of conspiracy theories, it's very much not my job to evaluate the individual conspiracy theories. You know, I'm not a climatologist. I can't evaluate the climate science. If climatologists tell me that climate change is real, then first of all, I accept their science because, you know, I I'm a behavioral scientist. I at least understand the scientific method as they're using it. You know, that they're, they're generating hypotheses, they're testing them and they're letting the data fall where it may and following it from there but what i can do is say okay these experts say it's legitimate 
And then what I'm studying is why do people believe that it's not given this overwhelming evidence? And that answer is not always good enough for people that believe these kind of things. So I, 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 of course, speak to a lot of people that believe this kind of stuff as part of my work. And it doesn't always, they don't always buy that, but mm. it's a bit of a tightrope you have to walk, I guess. Yeah, I suppose as well, people have their own interpretations of the evidence. So you could yes. say to someone, well, there's no, there's no evidence or this evidence isn't enough. But for some people, they'll look at it and they may have biased viewpoint, but they might look at it and think, actually, this for me is 100% confirmation. You know, you could think of, I don't know, one that comes to mind is like UFOs. You know, someone might see a, a, a video of a UFO and think, you know, that, that for me confirms, you know, whereas another person um, sure. might, you know, uh, 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 yeah, it's... Uh, it, it, I think it depends on what someone wants to believe sometimes, doesn't it? Yep. Um, I, I think that's absolutely right. And I think it, it, it does kind of come back to the, the kind of motivations we talked about at the beginning, you know, is managing uncertainty or indeed sometimes social identity. If your belief is part of that, if it's relevant to that, then that's definitely something that can come up and, mm -hmm. That might be the level at which it operates. That might be the mechanism that affects, you know, how you reason. I mean, that's specifically what I study is that relationship between reasoning and conspiracy beliefs. Of course, I'm going to go out to bat for that as a as the factor, but you see where I'm coming from, right? It's it's the sort of thing that if you have these motivations at play, maybe it means you don't engage in reflective reasoning as much as we discussed, or maybe it's the you so one finding that we get a lot for example is that in cognitive games where we test information sampling where we see how, how much information do you take from your environment before you form a conclusion about something we found over multiple studies now that we get this this negative correlation with sampling and conspiracy belief and what that means is people who strongly believe conspiracy theories tend to take smaller samples of data from their environment before forming conclusions so may maybe that's how that operates maybe it's that if you want to believe something your threshold is lower if you find one piece of confirmatory evidence you stop there but if you find something that's not you keep going until you find something that's a bit more palatable or maybe you're only keeping count of the ones that you know the mm. pieces of evidence that are favorable and you just cherry pick not... exactly mm. Yeah, see, I'm, I'm quite sympathetic to people who really believe in something and fight it because I think the examples of where conspiracies have been shown to be true, people have had to fight for that truth sometimes. And I think yeah. the people who, who did that would have been labeled as conspiracy theorists. They would have, you know, they would have yeah. been called all sorts and ultimately those you know I, I don't see any other way in some instances where the truth can't come to light unless people fight for it particularly as we said if it's an authority that you're working against i completely agree yeah it's something that has been turned into a pejorative right it's something that you can use in a very ad hominem way when you don't like the other person's point of view we've seen that happen in you know in election campaigns as well people get that, that label gets thrown around and it, it's just a way of shutting down another argument right it just de, de delegitimizes it and it it certainly muddies the waters because you know we're, b between the ones that are absolutely certifiably true like watergate and then on the other hand the ones that you know overwhelming evidence against like 9 11 being an inside job or climate change being a hoax you know but there's enough gray there and the pejorative usage of the term conspiracy theory doesn't really help that mm. at all that makes sense so uh, earlier on earlier on i kind of i talked about the philosophy literature and the debates between these kind of more epistemic definitions of conspiracy belief and the more kind of uh not so epistemic ones and i mean i'm not a philosopher so i can't weigh in too much on that debate but my personal view on that is that I prefer the latter. I prefer not to include epistemic caveats in my definitions on this because what I'm more interested in is the conspiracy belief, mm. right? So if you 
believe something and nothing will change your mind whether or not the belief turns out to be true whether or not the claim turns out to be true it's still interesting to me as a psychologist to me as a behavioral scientist that you know the way that this person interacts with evidence is kind of strange if that makes sense mm. so perhaps, perhaps that's one way to i mean as i said i have to kind of walk a tightrope as a psychologist because I'm, I'm not in a position to evaluate the claims directly i have to defer to experts and go from there and i'm more than happy to do so but that's kind of how i navigate that i guess mm. is to, to say i'm interested in the beliefs and the conspiracy theories well there's there's a lot of gray there in definitions mm. and things like that and it, it has consequences like what you've alluded to in terms of some pejorative usage and it shuts people down and it's something that poli certainly some authorities have taken advantage of at times with their usage of the term. I, I think that's fair mm. to say. Mm. And I suppose, it, speaking of the sort of consequences, when we've talked about instances where conspiracy theories are used by influential people to, you know, for, for um, malevolent reasons or to, throw people off or you know all that what what impact does that have on people who are susceptible to them where they're obviously not um there's no basis in truth sure that that's a very good question and it's it, it kind of alludes to a point that i guess I, I i certainly think is quite important with this topic which is that you know conspiracy theories do have consequences we kind of talked about the entertainment side of it earlier on which gives us you know it, it could fall people into thinking you know what's the harm right i've got this elderly uncle that i see once a year at christmas dinner and he spouts about the moon landing every time and no one takes him seriously what, what what's the problem but then you get people who i mean there are kind of multiple levels to the consequences so we've, we've kind of alluded to the psychological consequences already you think like depression stress and paranoia these things are all correlated in the literature with increased conspiracy belief. You have social consequences as well. So as one study, for example, from Poland, looking at conspiracy belief and the Smolensk air disaster. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this one. So basically, uh, in, I want to say, tw I always get the year wrong. I want to say 2010, but I could be wrong. It's in and around there. Uh, President of Poland, VP, and some other people we were on a private plane to Russia, and as it was coming into land, there was heavy fog, it crashed, and everyone aboard was, kicked, was sadly killed. And for some people in Poland, this wasn't a good, you know, the kind of natural weather version of this wasn't really good enough. And they started believing conspiracy theories that perhaps Putin had had something to do with this. And what one study has found is that People who believe the conspiracy theory and people who don't believe the conspiracy theory express less desire to, to socialize with people on the other side of this right. that makes sense so yeah. it's kind of it kind of discourages social closeness it kind of pushes people apart in times of, of societal trauma like this i imagine it, it was probably similar as well you know you hear after like brexit for instance you hear some people talking about how it split their family apart because mum voted remain and dad voted leave or something like that um and similar in the us as well of course divisions on political things so it has that kind of impact but then even worse it also has impact for people who don't believe them as well because people can go out and do violent things in the name of conspiracy theories. I mean, Anders Breivik in Norway, who shot up, you know, children, members of the Youth Labour Party in Norway, because he believed that Muslims were trying to take over his country. You know, people like that. You know, even even Hitler, he started with a conspiracy belief about Jewish people trying to dominate the world. So, you know, that there are definitely very dark consequences associated with these conspiracy theories and i mean you you mentioned consequences for believers one case that comes to mind quite strongly and that there are multiple levels to this one as to why this is kind of a very dark 
case in terms of consequences. But Dylan Roof in America, who uh, in I can't remember how long ago this was. I always forget the year. I want, I, again, I was was it twenty fourteen? Twenty fourteen. But anyway, he uh, had some conspiracy beliefs, which in effect were black people trying to take over America. And he felt so strongly about it that he got a gun. He went to a church in South Carolina, killed a bunch of people. And then he was arrested and so on. And not too long ago, because he, he was, I think he was sentenced to death, but they, they're appealing the sentence. And he recently changed his legal representation. I say recently, I'm talking like eight, maybe a year ago, but relatively recently. Uh, he changed his legal representation. And the argument for this was that their planned strategy to get him up to get him life in prison instead of death penalty was basically his mental health he's not very well he might have schizophrenia or something like this his agency might not be there they were trying that line of, of argument as it were and dylan roof didn't like this right because he what he wanted his defense to be was basically i'm right about black people right he wanted to get off on the basis that his conspiracy theory was true right I that see. is how toxic a hold this conspiracy belief had on this guy to the extent that like even in an arena where it probably would be in his self-interest to just lie and say i don't oh i don't know what i was thinking my men you know i i'm i'm under a lot of pressure right. or whatever and this conspiracy belief has got you know that there's a way in which he could, he could have gone against his own beliefs to save his own life and he won't even do that right i mean if that's not a damning indictment of what conspiracy beliefs can do to someone mm. believing them then i'm not sure what is yeah i mean what what's the what's the solution to that in terms of, is that something that's innate in human nature that we're always going to have those biases and we're always susceptible to being radicalized or is there a way that you can safeguard against that happening? It's a good question. There's a lot of literature on that at the moment. There's not, there's nowhere near enough on intervention as there is, for example, on like the factors that are associated with conspiracy belief. We're still, we're still hard at work on that one. There's, there's a lot of developing literature on like, Things like debunking, and the, at least my read on it is that it's kind of a mixed idea. So what I mean by debunking is, you know, you take the information route, you set a person down and you say, here's why you're wrong. So in, case, in the case of Dylan Roof, you say, you know, here's, here's why actually your racist conspiracy belief is actually not true. Hmm. That approach doesn't really seem to do very much. But I, I've seen mixed results on that one. It might depend on the conspiracy theory as well, but you kind of get the idea, right? I mean, we've we've all we've talked about a lot of like motivations that seem to trump, you know, honest engagement with these kind of things. And I suspect debunking probably runs into a lot of brick walls there, right? If I'm believing this thing because I want to feel less uncertain about the world, then you know, I'm not gonna let a little thing like being wrong getting my way, right? It's not gonna help me. It's You'll think gonna... the, you'd you'd think the debunking is part of the conspiracy. Yeah yeah exactly exactly they're trying to pull the wool over my eyes right they're trying to you know make me like the sheeple or whatever um so the approach the, the approach that i'd personally go out to back bat for although i'd caveat it by saying again this is a developing literature is you know a more kind of empathic route i mean if you have these motivations at play things like uncertainty and so on you're dealing with people that at the heart of it are scared of something they're uncertain for some reason or other and what they need really is an approach that speaks to the reason to these things to the reason why they believe these things in the first place they need an approach that speaks to the fact that they're uncertain they need an approach that speaks to the fact that they're frightened and i'm aware of some literature that shows that to work in the case of extremism I'm not aware specifically as it pertains to conspiracy belief because it's still a very young field. You know, there's still a lot of work going on. Mm. And I guess what I suggested probably pertains a bit more to people that are 
not necessarily the people that have gone as far down the road as Dylan Roof is. I mean, as far as this individual is concerned, I'm not sure there's anything that can help on that one other other than, I guess, putting him in prison and keeping him away from society. But, you know, that, that there's a lot of room between that and an individual like that, right? So you're put in a position where there's a question of prevention and there's a question of what you do after the fact. And I guess prevention, there's things like an empathic approach. There's things like pre-bunking, which is like before someone comes into contact with misinformation, you alert them to the presence of misinformation. You educate people about, you know, the kind of uh, parties that are standing to benefit from convincing you, for example, that climate change is a hoax or that, this group are doing this or that this election is fraudulent or whatever but as to someone that's already down there as to someone that's already gone as far as to start killing people over it yeah i don't i don't know it's mm. it's difficult yeah it is uh, um and and just on sort of your own research what are you working on at the moment so for my part, I'm looking at the kind of explanations that people with conspiracy theory beliefs prefer in the world. So we have this theory, the overfitting hypothesis, which we've been developing. And the idea behind that is that people with conspiracy, so basically that conspiracy belief is, uh, it's very good at explaining away immediate data. So if there's something that immediately unsettles you, you see, like a COVID story on the news or something like that. Conspiracy theories are very good at explaining that away, right? There's, no, there's nothing you could be confronted with that you can't come up with some kind of conspiracy belief about. But they're very bad at generalizing later on to wider data. So what that effectively means is that People with conspiracy beliefs sh should prefer more complex explanations to more simple ones, just in general, not mm. necessarily specific to their uh, the topic of the belief. Because the high kind of explanatory power that these beliefs have to immediate data, they haven't got that power because they're good explanations. They're not good explanations. They've got that power artificially by being so complex and so kind of all over the place and so overly specified to the thing I'm trying to explain away that that kind of ability to explain new media data is kind of inevitable. It's kind of artificial, mm. right? So what we're doing at the moment is we're looking at whether when you give people a choice between a simple explanation and a complex one, what do people with conspiracy beliefs do? And what we have so far, we have some preliminary data where basically we give them like a scatter plot of uh something completely contextually neutral nothing to do with conspiracy theories we give them some like fake data and scatter plot and we we ask them to choose between different lines of best fit right all right so like a like a straight line or a kind of quadratic curve or a more kind of curvy cubic right of increasing complexity and what we find in simple terms is that people with conspiracy beliefs consistently prefer the complex ones every right. time and this is in a context that has nothing to do with their beliefs that's very interesting so we're, we're yeah. probing that a bit more we'll see what we get yeah yeah that's fascinating um brilliant well michael it's been absolutely brilliant talking to you um i've had an absolute ball learning about this um and i've i've obviously always been interested in conspiracy theories even if i don't believe them um i'm okay. always interested in them and also the, the yeah. psychology behind them as well um so yeah thanks thank for having you. me yeah it's been great um so yeah thanks again smashing yeah cheers